Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, and we want to give um, an attorney here a special guest, um, Reyes Mohammed here. Um, we're so thankful to have him here. Um, so, as you guys know, we're here to learn more about how to protect your First Amendment rights. Um, there's so many questions right now rising due to the current conflict. And we're thankful that you guys are all here uh, because we know it's a Wednesday evening. This is taking time out of your your evening and or class. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Um, so we're going to learn about the, the legality of it, of protecting our First Amendment, right? Um, and now I'll go ahead and introduce him um, with the formal bio. That's okay uh -oh. with you. Um, just a brief one because he's absolutely amazing he also i would like to point out that he's on our board of care arizona for a while now and he does amazing work not only support us as a team but supports the whole community whether it be muslim or not he's a very well-known figure out here um, allegedly he's a legend um so um he's a co he co-founded rm warmer on the principles of representing entrepreneurs and content creators with personalized representation through the life cycles of their ventures. Reyes is the go-to lawyer for high-profile social media influencers, YouTubers, e-commerce businesses, inter internet entrepreneurs, and licensed professionals, including other law firm founders in all aspects of their conducting business online, including their litigation and transactional needs. Um, so, and that's just briefly some of the work that he does, um, but he also does civil rights um, work for CARE Arizona um, that we're very thankful for. So I will hand it over to you. If there's Thank anything you. else that you would like to share. Thank you, Isabel. Um, first of all, I want to greet everyone who's here and on Instagram with our Muslim <coughs> welcome and greeting of Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, I think it's particularly relevant in, in what's going on because when you say salam to somebody, you're conveying and endowing them with peace. And that's the message at the end of the day that we're all trying to convey. Um, as Itzimba said, you know, a core part of my practice is internet law, dealing with social media issues. I do civil rights work, mainly for this wonderful organization, CARE Arizona. Uh, but I have a particular interest in, obviously, the international issues that are going on. Um, today, we're here to talk about um, the most important amendment to me, which is the First Amendment of our United States Constitution, uh, what it means to peacefully assemble or protest, uh, where the boundaries are of protesting. Um, I hear and I read, if you're on social media, a lot of bad information about what it means to protest. Uh, everything is First Amendment in some people's minds. Um, so we want to talk about some generalities of before you even protest, what are some considerations to think about um, and then answer some questions that many we got a ton of questions yeah. uh, the organization has been busy batting phone calls and questions I'm gonna try to get through a dozen or so uh, one thing I can't do because I'm a licensed attorney is give you personalized legal advice because legal advice is very very case specific individualized but give me general questions you know like hey if I'm in the workplace and this happens to me frame it that way don't say hey, this is what happened to me on such and such date. What, what is your recommendation and advice to me? Figure out a creative way to say it in generalities if you want some advice. And if you know afterwards, maybe if you need a one-on-one -on -one or something, I'm happy to, to talk to you. But for people listening as well, I'm sure people will throw questions up. Um, we're streaming it on multiple channels. Um, those are my, that's my disclaimer, my lawyer disclaimer. So with that, um, and, and by the way, I'm not against questions on particular topics as I go through, but I think the first five minutes, the explanations I provide may answer a lot of questions. So maybe we wait until that part to start asking questions. Is that fair? Okay, awesome. So um, I find myself explaining to my clients who come to me in my office who ask about um, mostly the questions I get relate to social media when it comes to First Amendment issues. Uh, I, I find myself advising people on their rights, but then telling them not to do the XYZ right that they may have. So some people are hearing that are going to say, I thought you were a lawyer. Why are you telling me not to exercise my rights? And I'm not saying that, but I will say that the number one rule, this is sort of my footnote to the Constitution, 
uh, and a footnote to all rights that all people have is the don't be stupid rule. And it's a very simple rule. Um, what grade are you in? Seven. Seven. You will have no problem understanding this. You don't need to be a lawyer or anything technical. Uh, the don't be stupid rule. And the don't be stupid rule, particularly when it comes to protesting, stands for the simple idea that the rights that you have, whether by the First Amendment or otherwise, should be exercised always with precaution. There's a context for everything, and there's perspective for everything. In not every context does it make sense to start a protest, to join a protest, to say certain words. Um, to give you the best example, I don't talk to my mother the way I talk to my friends, and vice versa. I don't talk to a judge the way I would speak to all of you. Context matters with all communications, protests included. So that's the number one rule. Uh, to give you another analogy, uh, I was in New York City last week. I was in Times Square, a couple blocks from Times Square during the protests. Um, but one thing I noticed about New York City is when the sign says walk, not everybody jumps in the crosswalk, right? And so average person might say, hey, it's my right of way. Why shouldn't I cross? The guy who's coming down the street should stop for me. And that's true. That's what the law says. It's yield to pedestrians. But put yourself in that situation and you're crossing a busy intersection. Do you want to just take a chance and jump into the road and say, well, it's my right. And if he hits me, it's not my problem. Of course not. You'd be dumb to do something like that. Your, your free speech rights, the right to protest, and all rights work the same way. There's discretion. And I can't give you a perfect um, analysis and perfect advice on when to exercise those rights and in what circumstance. But the key takeaway for everyone listening is this. Have some wisdom when you exercise your rights, particularly in today's climate, particularly with the story of the Palestinians and what's going on and the 70 years of occupation and, and the gross you know, genocide that's happening today. It's very, very uh, emotion evoking. It's very angering. Um, and there are, it's, it's splintering your workplace, right? It's, divisive, it's a divisive issue. So you have to use wisdom. That's my number one piece of advice. Before we even talk about what the law says, before we talk about uh, what you can and can't do. My number one piece of advice is the don't be stupid rule. Think before you act. Don't react. Don't let emotion lead you. Very easy rule, right? Don't be stupid. Okay, see, I got seventh grader approval. Um, so now let's talk about the First Amendment, right? So as it relates to free speech, uh, the First Amendment gives you, and it applies to residents, we'll talk about that, not just citizens, it gives you the right to peacefully assemble and protest. What does that mean? Well, the First Amendment uh, has been interpreted to mean that you can stand in, physically be present in public places, sidewalks, parks, um, those are the most common areas, outside of municipal office, for example, public, what's considered public space, and you can protest peacefully. Um, and there's a lot to unpack just in that. What's a peaceful protest? Well, we've seen a lot of that in the last week or so. Peace, peaceful protest means a lot of things that common sense would, would dictate, right? Signage, you can chant, you can sing, you can make, make announcements, you can pass out flyers, you can fundraise and solicit for donations for a cause. Um, you can't obviously block a public roadway, even though the road is considered a public space. And the reason for that is the government has a right to give, uh, to, to attach reasonable restrictions on your right to free speech and your right to protest. One of those that we shouldn't forget, particularly when we're out protesting or attending a rally for any cause is uh, don't block the roadways, don't block the sidewalks, right? The common sense rule. Um, some of these mass protests that you see, again, don't just follow what you see on social media. Many of them have permits from the city, like city of Phoenix, for example. You can actually, there's a city manager, you call, you get a permit. Hey, we'd like to corner off Roosevelt, 7th Avenue, whatever. Uh, and, and have 5,000 people show up, no problem. The PD will show up, they'll cone it off for you. You don't just show up with 5,000 people and start chaos, right? Um, so knowing that ahead of time, doing a little diligence, and if you're watching this and you're from another city or state, call your city manager, 
ask what the requirements are to get a permit to hold a protest. Absent that scale, there's nothing stopping you from protesting on a sidewalk or a street. Again, the caveat is you can't block traffic, can't stand in front of a car. Um, we remember during the BLM times, there was a lot of um, unfortunate events that happened with people driving over other people and then finger pointing. This gets back to my don't be stupid rule. Um, in certain situations, people were being aggressive uh, beyond reason, right? So the idea is public spaces, you're allowed to uh, voice free speech. Let's take a step back. Who is your right to free speech exercisable against? Meaning, who do you have that right to and towards? What context? Uh, what people don't understand is you don't have a First Amendment right or, or free speech right in the private context, like work. We'll talk about some exceptions. But uh, free speech is a right you have as to the government, like cities, municipalities, federal, federal government agencies, people who accept um, Title IX funds, like public schools, private schools if they accept Title IX funds, charter schools, right? So the First Amendment doesn't apply in a movie theater doesn't apply in a private place of business unless you work for a city of Mesa, right? Or a city of Phoenix. Doesn't apply, you name it, right? Private schools are, I would include in that, that you don't have a, a right to free speech in private schools. Again, unless you get Title IX funding. My point is there are limits. And unfortunately, I find myself advising people, yeah, you have a First Amendment right, but that right attaches as to the government, not in private settings. Let's talk about, so does everyone understand that in terms of when, you know, who you have that right as to uh, who you can exercise it against, right? Um, public forums, the definition, courts have also <coughs> interpreted to mean social media, right? So we talk about censorship of social media, of, po of politicians, um, and censorship on social media. Generally speaking, social media platforms can cancel you. The platforms themselves, the Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, they're private organizations, and unfortunately, and I don't agree with this, right? Um, I would advocate for all speech. Um, they have the right to shut your account down. It's unfortunate. And so when the owners and operators of these social media platforms have a particular political slant, um, you can expect that they may decide that they don't like you and, and shut your account down. We're already seeing it. I have plenty of clients that are major influencers who, who are saying, look, I, I spoke out pro-Palestine and I have a million plus followers, and this is how I earn my living through endorsements, and my account got shut down, what can I do? You may have options, but you most likely can't sue for that. Um, there's a lot of federal laws that protect those platforms, okay? So those are, those are the circumstances in which your First Amendment right apply, and that's who they apply against. Let me talk about schools for a second, because I know we had a lot of questions on school schools, and, and I have had a lot of questions come to me personally about can my son do this or college student this such and such happened um, public institutions universities absolutely are places where you can exercise your right to protest okay now there's caveats remember we talked about the reasonable restrictions most institutions high schools um, colleges in particular have policies that dictate how and when you can protest for example, and this actually applies to general, general protests on the street, there's sound ordinances. So you can't stand with a megaphone at 10 p.m. and start yelling, free Palestine. You just, you can't. Um, even if it's not at 10 p.m., most likely you can't use loudspeakers, again, unless you got a permit for it. And the reason for that is there are sound ordinances. It could be a distraction. They don't want loud noises with megaphones amidst traffic. It causes confusion for drivers. Schools have the same thing. Every, nearly every university in the United States of America has a policy you can ask um, that tells you how you can protest without getting in trouble with school. And most of them are very reasonable, okay? Um, those restrictions can't be content specific. So I wanna make sure you understand this because this is where we get into the rights that you have. A university that is public cannot, or high school can't say you can protest um, pro-IDF, pro-occupation, 
on this campus, but mm, we don't like the, you pro-Palestinian people. You guys are weird. That would be treating two groups differently. It's censorship. It's content-based limitations. And that's, where, that's what we look for. When people come to me and say, um, I was censored or I couldn't protest or say a certain thing, I'm looking for, is it a content-based thing or is it something you did, right? Did you cause an obstruction in the streetway or did, did you say something um, that was obscene or offensive? We'll talk about what that means, obscenity rules, but I think you get the point. The point is that colleges also have reasonable restrictions. So if you're a college student, you're organizing a protest or you're planning to go to a protest, don't wait for the organizers to tell you these are the policies. It would be smart for you if you care about your career to find out what those policies are, right? Because you don't want to get um, in trouble with the school, whatever that means. Now, I will say this. We've had people ask um, about, well, what's a reasonable punishment if my kid didn't know, particularly in high school? Can they just suspend my kid for, for making pro-Palestinian comments um, at a protest on campus because he had a technical violation um, maybe it was not during lunch hours or he used a megaphone. And there's an argument to say that's excessive and they're probably singling him or her out. And so we look at how is the school in the past disciplined people, what's their policy and disciplinary. But suspension is pretty egregious, right? A, a one week, two week. Expulsion is even more so. And, you know, there are, um, there are rights that you have, due process rights. There's usually a process procedure before you can be kicked out of school. Um, for, for those kinds of things. But the bottom line is ask, find out. Remember, just to give a high level comment, remember your reason for protesting. Your reason for protesting is not to be violent, cause commotion and get attention. Maybe for some people. If, if that's why you're doing it, my advice to you is don't protest. If you're doing it to deliver a message, that's amazing. And there's so many great ways to deliver messages, right? So we've talked about you know, First Amendment, what that means. We've talked about the confines of it, when it does apply, doesn't apply, right? Gover it applies to the government, doesn't apply in the private context. Um, we're talking about schools. Let's talk about the workplace. So remember we said your First Amendment right is a right that you have as to the government. Well, if you're employed by a private employer, when I say private, I mean um, not a government or a city agency or state agency, not taxpayer funded. You don't exactly have a First Amendment right to say what you want in the workplace. And people are surprised to hear that, right? We'll talk about distinguishing that from being discriminated against because of something you said online. That's different. But in the workplace, if I walk in, um, you know, with a megaphone saying, free Palestine, you guys are zealots, you don't support, uh, you know, you're supporting the occupation, you guys should be rallying, you're crazy, and you start yelling at the cube, you know, people in their cubicles, and you're going to get fired. And don't call me when that happens, because I'll probably say, I told you, I told you so. Um, and the reason for that is because your rights end when you walk into a private workplace, to a degree, to a degree. And we'll talk about what rights you still have. But you can't disturb the workplace. In particular, in Arizona, we're an at-will employer. So they could let you go because you came 15 minutes late, technically, or no reason at all. What employers can't do or shouldn't do, private employers, is teach, uh, treat people disparately, treat people differently. So again, Bob is pro IDF, pro occupation, right? Ahmed is pro Palestine and against the occupation. He gets censured at work. He gets terminated. This dude over here, nothing happens to him because yeah, the boss is uh, Zionist and would love to see more of that. Well, now you engage in discrimination. So this is this is now different from First Amendment. I'm going to move away from First Amendment for a second, talk about civil rights and discrimination, right? So the Civil Rights Act and the First Amendment are parallel in many respects, and they intersect at certain points. So now we're talking about discrimination. Um, private employers under the Civil Rights Act cannot discriminate against you um, if you are within a protected class. And protected class is a defined term. So that includes, for example, race, includes nationality, includes religion, includes gender, right? There, there may be other classes, but if you are in a protected class and you are being discriminated against because you are part of that protected class, that is a problem. That is against the law. You'd have a civil right. You'd have a civil rights violation. You could sue for that. So when people ask me, 
and say, hey, I got fired because I said something pro-Palestine. Well, it doesn't complete the picture. We need to look at what happened. Was there discrimination? Um, and I have, in the last several days, I've had a lot of calls in my office and CARE is an organization, CARE is Arizona has had a lot of calls about this. And it's, it's very nuanced, okay? Um, it's, 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 there's no quick and dirty answer for me to say yes, yes, this is okay, no, this was bad, you have a lawsuit, or you know, somebody violated your civil, your civil rights or your First Amendment rights. It's very, so I'm giving you very high level sort of guidelines. Bottom line is, at work, you have the right not to be discriminated against because you're Muslim, because you're Christian, because you're Jewish, you're exercising your faith, you're exercising your right to be pro-Palestine or whatever. Uh, if you're being treated in a discriminatory fashion, that's a problem, okay? Private employers. That's what we're looking for in the context of private employment. Now, I deal with social media issues, as many of you know, and many people have asked me, well, what about social media? Not in work, physically, but online. Generally speaking, your employers can't say and shouldn't say and shouldn't do anything to you when you're doing something off work time, perhaps lunch hour or after hours, posting whatever you want on social media. Okay? Footnote, and I'll come back to it, the don't be stupid rule. We'll come back to what that means and how it applies. Um, but as, as a matter of, of your rights, sure, you can say whatever you want after hours, and technically your employer should not take any action against you. Now here's the problem. Suppose they do. How are you going to prove that it was because of a discriminatory reason? That's the problem. Um, I've had some specific examples of, of doctors who have made statements and the board of directors at the hospital decided that, you know what, we think this interferes with their independent medical judgment. Like we don't think that this doctor could treat um, a, a Zionist or Jewish child the same way they may treat a Muslim or Palestinian child. So we're going to fire you because we think it interferes with your medical judgment. That could be a basis. I don't know. It depends on what you said. Right? And the reason I'm bringing these examples is because we're hearing about the mutilation and the torture of children and the uprising and um, coming back to my footnote of don't be stupid. We want to bring attention to these issues. Like We want to be vocal about it. We don't want to hide and run from it. But what you say matters. How you deliver the message matters. Okay? Does everybody understand that? So it is possible in certain situations for your employer to take adverse action against you because of something you said online. Depends on what was said, depends on the context. What we're looking for in those cases is discrimination. So um, the other thing I want to say about social media real quick is, again, I deal with this, this is my world. Uh, there's a lot of false information, a lot of disinformation. We've seen it, I mean, even before this issue started recently, uh, we saw it with BLM. There's a lot, like made up images, so and so. I saw something recently where there was, um, you know, the, the prime minister or somebody from Qatar was making an announcement and I don't, I'm not fluent in Arabic, but it's in Arabic subtitles and somebody's translating it and saying, oh, there's going to be a boycott of gas and oil, Qatar's going to do this. Turns out to be completely fabricated. If you don't speak Arabic, you would have no idea. You just read this translation. You'd hit forward on your WhatsApp. You'd, you'd blast it on TikTok, Instagram. At the end of the day, you're an idiot. So verify. Like, this is something I tell to all my clients and as Muslims and regardless of your position, your religion, but when you're protesting, it's especially important because that's a great way to lose credibility, right? So um, things are getting debunked every day. It seems like every hour, just be cautious, do your own research. Um, the best sources to trust when you're engaging in protests and you're talking about issues are people doing the grassroots work who are quote unquote on the ground um, policy makers are also a good source of, you know, legislative actions, you know, legal issues that arise, but there's no better source than somebody who's on the ground, who's telling a narrative that can be understood and can't be taken out of context, right? So my, going back to my first rule that I started with, don't be stupid. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pause for a second and I'm, I know this is like drinking from a fire hose. It's like a lot of law and a lot of, um, but the people who are sitting here and maybe on Instagram, I don't know if people are dropping questions in there. I haven't looked at mine, um, but 
I have a list of like 12 questions. If there are high level questions, and again, I, I can't answer like, hey, this happened to me, what's your advice to me? But what questions do you guys have who are sitting here on, um, <coughs> yeah, please. Um, if someone is in the process of an adjustment of status with immigration, can a pro-Palestine <coughs> message online affect their adjustment? Can that be held against them? Yeah, I love that question because it's complicated, but it's, I have a very, I, I think I have a good answer for you. So your messaging, the government should not use the content of your message against you. Now, here is the problem. There is some degree of discretion as to the content of the message. If, if what you're saying supports a terrorist organization, and whether you like it or not, Hamas is a terrorist organization. That's my personal position. That's in their charter. It is what it is. Okay, I don't want to debate that. If you say something supporting a terrorist organization, there goes your status, most likely. Um, so the don't be stupid rule. But generally, free Palestine, you know, protect the people, I'm against the occupation, it should never, that, the content of that message should never be used against your status. But you raise a good point and I missed it, which is um, who does the First Amendment apply to? And I just wanna underscore this. Fortunately, our constitution applies to residents, which means you're a domiciliary, you live here, um, or you're here. So that's regardless of your visa status, your citizenship status, you have the rights. You have the right to protest, to participate in a protest. You cannot be deported for simply protesting. Now, let's go and add some context. If you commit a felony during a protest because you were violent, maybe you assaulted a cop, you could have your status pulled, declined, you could be deported, right? So there's caveats to everything, but as a, that was a really good question. Related to yep. your your <coughs> your point about forwarding things and using discretion and wisdom, uh, how do you categorize like getting the source from a primary source versus like a secondary source? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a tough one because uh, depends on what it is. You know, if you're looking at something that's a written text, mm -hmm. you know, like an article. Fortunately, with AI and Google and reverse image search, you can get a pretty quick. If somebody's claiming that somebody said something and it's in writing, you could typically find it indexed on Google very quickly. Um, so we see like news reports, that's a report. Hey, such and such, you know, the hospital was bombed and reports are stating, I'm, I'm saying the report says that a preliminary investigation shows that it was Israeli airstrike. For example, okay, you could literally take the text of that, you could Type it in, the first five words of that report into Google, and put the uh, publisher or author, you will likely get a hit. If it's published, it's gonna index on Google, most likely. That's it, one way. The difficult ones are the images and videos. Um, because very easy to doctor. And what I do is I try to, you can also put images into Google and other search engines and do reverse search. I try to find the source of that, I really do. I don't like to repost, um, and even even credible people make mistakes. They're posting what somebody else said, right? Hearsay of hearsay. And um, it's our duty not to do that. And so whatever diligence you can do, if there's a date alleged in the video that this was reported and this is, this is who this person is, take 10 seconds or longer, do a quick search, See if you can find it, ask around if anyone has validated. What's cool is if you are in um, some of these you know, chat groups, sometimes friends, they'll say, hey, I heard this, did anyone else hear that? What, what are the source, what's the source? Um, at a minimum, I would, I would do something like that. Because it's too easy, right? It's too easy to share, like, comment, um, and get debunked and then lose credibility. That's a good question. Right behind you, there's a question. Yes? Yeah, I wanted to build off of her question, where is like, if you're also maybe, because there have been a lot of reports coming from the government, from people within the government that have been incorrect and that yes. have been debunked. If you say something along the lines of, this person said something wrong, like you should, like, not to go as far as like, don't trust them, but like <clears throat> along those lines, could that also harm 
any sort of status or like any sort of possible employment or like future opportunities? Yeah, great question. So, so I think to rephrase your question, if you cite to an, even an official account of something, but that official account is debunked, right? And then you shared it in the context of like your immigration status, could that be used against you? Or even generally in employment, could that be used against you? Is that, is that your question? A no? little bit. <laughs> like okay. If they, so for example, when Biden was saying, I've seen reports that we're uh. beheading babies and that turned out to be false. Yeah. And you're like, Biden, you shouldn't be saying things like this because it's untrue. You're like, you're saying false information and you're creating a narrative which is like spiraling. Could a comment like that harm uh, calling out Biden? Call, yeah, this, calling out people within government or like <clears throat> government agencies. Great, great question. Uh, this gets back to content-based censorship or content-based consequences. The government does not have the right to use that against you. So if you want to call Biden a moron, this policy is ridiculous, the guy shouldn't be president, you should have every right to say that and you should have no problems with your immigration. Now, what I'll tell you is, there might be something in your case file that just puts that remark over the edge. You should talk to your immigration, an immigration lawyer about it, but generally speaking, this is the type of censorship. It, it, is, an, it is an example of censorship by, by demonstrating a consequence to somebody in the middle of an immigration proceeding by saying, well, you did say this about Biden. Right, or if they're Republican, you did say this about Trump or you know, DeSantis in Florida. Uh, so you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna give you stat your status. It, it shouldn't be used against you. Yeah, that's a great question. The beheaded babies one is a, is a great example because um, you have somebody like the president claiming to have received this and it got he pulled back on that so hard but so many sources cited to that mm -hmm. it became a which came first right game so it's just another reason why pause right and so the problem we have now and it, it's it's just a problem of social media which is the virality with which information flows is things are published and then debunked within an hour or two but it's gone to millions of people and you may not know and you may republish it right um, other questions from people sitting here, anything we talked about, I'm going to run through, um, and I want this to be helpful for you guys sitting here and, and keep engagement. So if you do have questions, please don't hesitate, raise your hands. Uh, there was a question earlier asked, is there a way to send a letter to my employer or school voicing my concern for biased anti-Palestinian rhetoric anonymously if I have the fear of retaliation? Great question. And fortunately, CARE Arizona, we actually put together a letter, a template. We have a, we have a template. We can give it to you. Uh, you can review it. We can send it to you. We can send it to school anonymously and just say that we were contacted by one of your constituents. This is the concern, and it's it's a form letter. So we're happy to give that as a resource. If anyone's listening, we can uh, what they can ask either by email or Instagram DM, yeah. um, and we're happy to give it to you. Same with in place of employment. We wrote, we wrote one for private employers as well. We can do it anonymously. Say this is behalf of Care Arizona. An employee came to us, and they can't take um, they can't take adverse action against you for that. The fact that you fear being retaliated against, and then they retaliate against you, underscores the idea of discrimination. Right? Um, what can I do if I'm stopped by the police during a protest? I love this question. Uh, I didn't get into the nitty gritties of like physical things you should and shouldn't do during protests, but I've seen a lot of things that you just shouldn't do in protests from our community. Um, like I said, there's anger, there's outrage, there's emotions. The last thing you want to do is get arrested. The last thing you want to do is get charged with a felony, property damage or something. So the Constitution protects peaceful assembly and protest. doesn't protect breaking uh, property, defacing, you know, or harassing or physically assaulting people. So if you're stopped by police during a protest, what you can do is usually officers will just, the first thing they do is ask for identity, your ID. I would not fight police on this. If they ask for ID, there's no problem sharing ID. The problem is if they hold you and they don't let you leave, free to leave, um, then you're considered to be under arrest. So what you should do is if you're stopped, you ask why you're stopped, you ask what the problem is, they may ask for ID. Your next question is, 
officer, am I free to leave? Because if you're not free to leave, then your right to remain silent starts from that point because you're technically under arrest. There's exceptions like at borders and in airports and certain things. But during protest, that's my rule of thumb. Uh, where can I protest? We answered this question. How can I protect my identity during protest? <clears throat> Good luck. Um, even masks nowadays, internet sleuths and internet trolls can figure out who you are. There's nothing wrong with wearing a mask, covering your face, those kinds of things. Um, I get it. You can wear a hat. You can wear sunglasses. You know, those kinds of things. Um, what do I do if I believe my rights have been violated by police, employer, or school? Um, definitely connect with the civil rights attorney as soon as you can. You should preserve any evidence you have, letters, you know, text messages, emails. Um, you can call Care Arizona. They can figure out, you know, do an intake with you, figure out if there's something we can do. Um, can I get fired from my job for posting my personal belief on social media? We talked about this one. And the answer is you should not get fired, but you can. It's possible. It depends on if the basis for termination was discriminatory. Um, in Arizona, you can fire somebody because you were five minutes late. We're at will. You can fire them for no reason. The actual motivating factor, the cause of the termination matters. So if they're discriminating against you, it's illegal. If they're not, they think you're kind of weird. Your boss could potentially let you go. But again, if they treat somebody else differently than you for doing the same thing, it's probably a problem for the employer. Um, doxing was a big one. We had a lot of questions on doxing. And you probably all know what doxing is. It's when somebody reveals your identifying information online, your full name, your address. So uh, what's interesting is just publishing your real name and your identity and where you live online by itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, in most cases, where you live is public information. Where you work may not be public. But the point is, there is a statute in Arizona. We, we copied California. There is actually a criminal statute on Title 13. I'm forgetting the exact <coughs> citation. But there is a, a statute that criminalizes doxing when it is done with the intent to harass or intimidate or cause physical harm. So I'm posting something on Instagram. My Instagram handle doesn't have my real name. Somebody sees it or I'm in a physical you know, protest. I'm a student on campus. Somebody takes a picture of me, uses reverse image search, finds out my name and says, hey, that's Raiz. Um, I, have, I own my own firm, but let's say they contact a client of mine and say, you know, let's show him, let's show up at his house and show him what we think and not let him sleep peacefully tonight. I would argue that that's intimidation and harassment. Uh, it is a misdemeanor. It's a crime um, at a minimum. If you engage in, in a physical assault, it's obviously a big deal. But um, the problem is getting police officers to take that complaint seriously. And like I said, just posting your information al online alone is likely not <clears throat> sufficient to have created uh, a criminal implication. So it just depends on what happened. I, I see a lot of complaints on, hey, I just got posted on uh, antisemitism.com, whatever that, stop antisemitism.com. Again, this is a tactic. You know, most people who are getting post posted there are not anti-Semitic. They are pro-Palestine, and it's very, very different, as we all know. Um, and it's unfortunate. Um, and maybe there's some false statement that has some implication and maybe you have a defamation case. I don't know. It's case specific. But pro the, my point is doxing, again, if it's, if it's done with the intent to cause physical harm, then uh, that's illegal. Um, what can merit me getting kicked out of university? What words or phrases should I avoid to use? Is it okay to say Israel kills children? Or do I have to say Israeli government IDF? This is a good question. It's very specific. Um, what I would say is, again, public universities and colleges, um, high schools, can't engage in content-based, should not engage in content-based censorship. But um, that doesn't mean that they can't say, we don't like what you said. And this, actually, this is actually what happens, is uh, a university chancellor or somebody will say, there was a protest that was anti-occupation and we view this as as being anti-semitic 
And while they have a First Amendment right to engage in this conduct, we don't like it. We all know what that means, okay? It's just stopping short of saying it. But do they have a right to say that? Yeah. Do they have a right to kick you out of school? Absolutely not. This question about kill, Israel kills children, uh, Israeli government, IDF, oh, my, I don't know. I mean, what I would say is just have evidence to back up what you're saying. Um, context matters, and the school can't technically censor you for content-based communications. Don't say anything violent. Don't threaten people. Um, that's the don't be stupid rule. Um, so those were some of the key questions that people had. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so if you were being doxxed online, right, what would you suggest that this person does? Like, do they call the police? Should they stop posting? Um, yeah. What, what, what do you suggest? Um, doxing is definitely an intimidation tactic, right? <clears throat> It's specifically being done to get you to shut up. Um, your comfort level with being doxxed, I, I'm not going to say, yeah, keep going or stop. It's, some, it's a decision you have to make. But what you can do is really, there's two things you, you can do and you should do. If you feel like there was a threat that you were doxxed and then there's a, a threat, a tacit one even, that says, let's show them, let's show this person who's boss or contact their employer. I mean, you should definitely call the police if there's any sort of inference of harm or any statement of harm. Call the police, preserve the screenshot, right? Take a screenshot, try to figure out who it's coming from, save it, make a police report at a minimum. Uh, there's kind of an escalated doxing where they contact your place of employment and maybe there's they add something false. For example, one I saw recently was, this person believes that all Jews should die. I've never met a single person who's ever said that, okay? But I've seen the allegation that this person believes that all Jews should die. And they send that to your boss. And you get fired for that, you would absolutely sue them civilly for defamation. I mean, it's just, there's actual damage, there's actual harm for that. So those are some of your options. At a minimum, report it to the police. There's different <laughs> levels, right? I mean, if there's threats of physical harm, police should do something about it. Um, you can call Care Arizona to look at it, to give you some direction. If it escalates into harming you financially, you're, they're calling your clients, they're calling your boss. You may even call a lawyer and, and ask if you have a right to take private action against that person for any um, actual harm that incurred. We had a yeah. question following that similar thought process. If someone's information is put on these websites, are there ways to get it removed? And how much of your public information do people have a right to share? Yeah, so um, if you're doxxed, can you get your information removed? And then what was the second part? What? And then how much are people allowed to share about your information? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, it depends on the site that you're posted on. Um, Google now has a process, it's free, you don't have to pay anyone to do it, can remove certain personally identifying information through a Google de-indexing form where you just fill out the form. If you just search Google de-index personal information, it will be a Google form, it's not gonna be a private company's form. That's one way. That will not get you off of that website. It will just get you out of a Google search result. Um, most of these sites won't take it down. You can ask. Um, but their whole position is uh, they have a right to keep it up because it's a user-generated content. You can't sue the website, unfortunately. So your options are limited. Um, you should you should try really hard not to get posted on those sites. I know I know that's difficult advice to follow. Um, in terms of the amount of information that can be shared, um, again, anything that's public, most people's addresses are public, and if I make a post and I'm readily identifying myself, and somebody just searches my name, and they find Zillow or they find public record on Maricopa County Assessor and say, this is the address, this is where they live. It is public record. It's what's attached with that that matters more. Do this to this person, show, you know, take some action. So the other information is, look, I mean, anything that you put out there, I think this goes without say, you're putting it out in the universe, anybody can use it and cite it. Right, so just be careful about what you put out there. Okay, 
Yeah. Other questions? Uh, we have one more question. Mm -hmm. There's a website that Israeli and anti-Palestinian anti -Palestinian protesters have where they keep track of everyone who bad-talked Israelis and posted against them. Is this legal? Yeah, that's the anti stopantisemitism.com. I think that's the website. There's three of them. There's three. I'm sure there's even a lot more. <laughs> there's three major ones. Three major <laughs> ones. Um, look, I've, I've seen some of these sites. Um, it's really, it's terrible to get posted on that because, again, most people are not being anti-Semitic. They're, they're pro-civilization, pro-humanitarian. Um, so if you get posted, um, you know, what can you do? Your, your options are just limit. Your options are limited. I mean, um, if the person posting you on that site is saying something that you did not say, we, right, the example I just gave, you may be able to sue the person who posted you. You're not going to be able to sue the website because of federal protections to the platform. But um, sometimes you see it, right? On Twitter, they'll say, hey, post this person on, I think there's an actual, there's several Twitter accounts that belong to these people. Mm -hmm. So look at what information is attached to what they're saying in order to get you posted on those sites. And if that information is false, they're, they're making an egregious accusation. There may be something you can do to the person who said get you posted. But again, the problem is if you get posted on there, there's not a ton you can do. By the way, I should just say this. Most people know if you're on those sites, nobody, nobody really cares other than the people who run those sites and who have an affiliation with that. I, again, I wouldn't want to be on those sites either, but if you read, like I've gone to some of these sites and you read like what a person said to get up there, there's academics, there's historians, there's people holding a sign that didn't say anything more than free Palestine. It's just, it's ridiculous is what it is. Um, thank you so much. That's all, unless anyone has additional questions. Um, also, yeah. I follow Ray's, Ray's page. He has so much like content on his Instagram, and we'll attach it to the live. Yeah, my well. firm. You can put my firm one up. Um, but no, thank you, thank you guys for for coming in person, and um, you know, just the most important, just concluding comment is just be smart. You know, um, people out there want you to screw up. They want to make you a target. They want to say, look at what this guy or gal did. And don't we don't want to fall into that trap. I mean, we, there's a lot of wisdom in protesting and conveying the message and, and um, keep at it. Just be smart about how you do it. That's the best way to stay out of trouble's way. That's cool. Thank yeah, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.